supporting patient self-care using the CF Health Hub digital health learning platform. My name is Charlotte Carolan. I have an MSc in physiotherapy and I work for Sheffield Teaching Hospitals in the United Kingdom. There are no relationships to disclose related to this presentation. So where did the CF Health Hub journey begin? It started with a young lady who had a very supportive father and he helped her to take her nebulizer treatments in quite a strict routine. She required minimal support from us and would attend independently about every three monthly for a regular checkup appointment. But one day she arrived with her mum, which struck us immediately to be quite unusual. She said to us that she felt very unwell, breathless, had been coughing up blood and she felt very scared. As a team, we looked at her normal metrics and her FEV1 had dropped by 10%. And straight away we thought, well, what can we do? How can we fix this? Should we get more bloods, get some sputum, do some imaging perhaps? Or are there other tests we need to be looking at to find out the reason why she isn't feeling well and why her lung function has dropped? But rather than rush to arrange expensive and often invasive tests or procedures, we instead were able to download her nebulizer adherence data onto the computer. When we reviewed the time series data, as you can see in this diagram, we could see that her self-care routine had dropped significantly during the four, month, four months prior to her clinic appointment. She had gone from taking over 70% of her treatment to only taking about 15% of treatment. But we didn't judge, we didn't criticise and we didn't point the finger. Instead, we shared her data with her and came alongside her and we discussed what had been going on in those four months prior to her attending clinic. She was a young adult and she'd just started college. And because this college was closer to her mum, she'd moved from her dad's house and was now living with her mum. She wanted fiercely to become independent and had been trying to take her nebulizers herself but she was finding it very difficult. Because we had her self-care data, we were able to say to her, look, it's okay. We don't need to admit you and put you through a ream of tests or procedures. In fact, you have untreated CF, so let's work together to help you to take more treatment because actually these treatments really do work. And so by adding just one word, we can change everything. For a long time, we have suggested that an adequate assessment of CF requires FEV1 and BMI, when in fact we now know an adequate assessment of, B of CF should actually require FEV1, BMI and adherence. And the treatments really do work. Over the decades, we have seen vast advancements in CF care, and as such, the life expectancy of our patients has increased significantly. This is because millions has been invested in the treatments to try and help develop our patients, help them to live a longer life. More recently, we've obviously had triple therapy and all this is contributing to that life expectancy that has grown so significantly. But actually, how much money has been invested to make sure that these great treatments are actually taken? Well, this is the challenge that we face. And it's quite clear, Quitner et al found that 51% of patients with CF in the United States of America collect less than 50% of their prescribed treatments. And this leads to great therapy costs, as you can see in this illustration. Lots of money being spent trying to rescue those patients who aren't taking their treatments at home. And this is the reality in the UK. A study led by Tracy Daniels et al, who is a specialist cystic fibrosis physiotherapist, found that objective download data was actually much lower than anticipated at 36%, far lower than what the clinicians or even the patients had predicted. So it is clear that without true objective data, self-care is just unknown, and as such, it is impossible to make an adequate assessment of CF. So how do we make the invisible visible? We chipped the e-flow and created the e-track. 
and this smart nebulizer records time and date stamp data. So after every actuation, that data is sent through a transmitted via a survey server into the CF Health platform. Both patients and clinicians can then see this data by the web or an app on their phone. The CF Health on platform delivers nebulizer adherence data, as you can see here in this bar graph. And it colour coordinates according to whether the patient has managed to meet their target and take their entire treatment, or whether they have taken some or none of their treatments. We can also change to day, daily or weekly data. And we can change the format from this bar graph to a line graph, or even just written data in a list format. It also dis displays the target that has been set, and this is an agreement between the clinician and the patient. And it also shows within this shaded area where intravenous antibiotic therapy has been had. CF Health Hub can also display the days of the week that treatment has taken place. And it can also display when the time of day when that treatment has taken place, which is really important when we're looking at patterns of behaviour. And as a direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the need for patients to self-shield at home, the platform has now been developed so that patients can now self-input their spirometry and weight from home via the app for the clinician to review back at the CF Centre. The offer of the platform is constantly evolving to meet those demands of the patient and the clinical teams. And we are exploring new ways in which we can get that data transmitted digitally in the future. So have you heard the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but how can you make him drink? So CF Health Hub obviously can deliver the metrics that matter to the clinical teams. But actually, how do we get patients to change their behaviour and take more of their self-care regimens? And more so, how do we change the, the behaviour of the clinicians so that they embrace this data and use it for their clinical decision making? Well, when we look into the literature at models of behaviour, we can see that there are numerous behaviour models there. They're often complex. And these behaviour change models are often incomprehensible. So let's consider the US judicial system. Under US criminal law, in order to prove that someone is guilty of a crime, one has to have three things. The means or the capability, the opportunity and the motive to want to undertake that criminal activity. The factors affecting behaviour are depicted by the US judicial system. And this informs a combi model that has been a framework developed by Suzanne Mitchie. It shows how a person's motivation, capability and opportunity affect their behaviour, but in turn how that behaviour then affects motivation, capability and opportunity. A behaviour change concept that is simple to understand and use. Rob Horn further unpicks adherence behaviour and describes it as being affected by a can't or a won't feeling. This links a person's thoughts of the necessity and their concerns to their motivation. If someone doesn't see the necessity for a change or has concerns about that change, then they won't do the behaviour because they won't be motivated. And for those who feel that they can't do a behaviour or, or they lack the opportunity and capability to do so, So here you can see the COM-B model with Horn's can't won't theory incorporated. So how do we ensure that with capability, opportunity and motivation, we can sustain that behaviour change? We need to maintain habit and, uh, habit and attention. By creating automatic behaviours, we can continue with minimal effort. Habits depend on context, so for many, Brushing your teeth is something that we've learned to do when we were young. We do it when we wake up in the morning and when we go to sleep at night. And it's by that repetition at a young age that's formulated that habit. And now that habit is established, it's now free. But to sustain change, we need to consider habit formation and self-regulation, bearing in mind if the context of an 
of an activity changes, then a different behaviour may be required and self-regulation and habit formation may be lost. So although we are all brush our teeth in the morning, it's a habit that we do from such a young age, what happens if the context of brushing our teeth changes? So for example, imagine you go camping and you need to brush your teeth at night, but it's cold, it's raining, the washroom is a little way away from where your tent is and it's a bit sludgy underfoot. Would you go and brush your teeth? Or might you choose not to bother? Or in fact, might you even forget to? And it is this concept of habit formation and self-regulation that underpins the comprehensive behaviour change interventions that CF Health Hub offer. And we've come a long way. CF Health Hub was founded in 2015. And in that time, we have delivered one of the largest randomised control trials to have taken place within the field of cystic fibrosis in the UK, and we've had promising results. We found significant difference in adherence emerging by week 12, and this has been sustained over a 12 month period. The mean difference of 18% was seen with an adjusted mean of 9.5%. And interestingly, we have found that there's a significant reduction in the perceived burden of treatment taken as reported by the patients. What we also found out of the RCT is the adherence baseline of our cohort of patients was very similar, if not slightly lower, than that that was seen in Leeds in the Tracy Daniels studies, where she found 36% adherence. Across the collaborative, we found 32% adherence. We are now in a position that we have come out of the RCT and we've created something called the Digital Learning Health System. We've got 17 UK CF centres using this system and we've formed this national collaborative so that we can share our practice during weekly calls and also during a biannual collaborative conference that is held. We now have over 1,500 patients on the system and we've, we're going to be extending this offer to another 600 plus in the next few months nationally. And this is a direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic and our intention to try and help our patients shield more at home. But what is the benefit for the patients? Let's discuss this example case. This was a patient who was female and had the complications of diabetes, pancreatic insufficiency and pseudomonas. She had an FEV1 of 44% and a BMI of below 19. Just before the pandemic, she came to the team and she said that she was quite concerned that she started to have an incre increased cough. And this had only got worse as the pandemic had continued. But rather than arranging for an IV antibiotic course for her, instead we sat down together and we looked at her CF Health Hub data. And what we found was that the pandemic started and it caused great disruption in her household. She was now at home and having to homeschool her children and therefore her own self-care routine had gone out the window and she was really struggling with treatment. Her average, her average adherence had significantly fallen for her. So we came up with an individualised action plan. We gave her two weeks of oral antibiotics and we supported her with her self-care routine. This patient increased her daily treatment, as you can see from her baseline, up to 83% post-intervention. She completed the oral antibiotics and therefore there was no need actually for IV antibiotics as all her symptoms were resolved. This helped to reduce the burden on the NHS at a very difficult time, but also reduced her potential exposure to COVID-19. This individual story demonstrates how CF Health Hub can provide teams with detailed self-care data via virtual data capture. It supports patients remotely to form self-care routines, and this is paramount, especially in the current environment that we're all working through. So what do patients think? I want to show you a short clip where patients describe what they think about CF Health Hub. Um, a few years ago, I was awful at taking my nebs. Very rarely did I do them, simply because I couldn't see. It was out of mind that they weren't there until I went to a clinic appointment. But now that it's on my phone and on an app, easy to see, 
it makes it so much easier to track what I'm doing. I, I found it really helpful because uh, it's, it's actually also having the, the data there, it means that then it's not a discussion between the patient <coughs> and the, the member of the CF team of like, um, oh, could you be doing more? Um, I'm already trying really hard and it, it, in a way it sort of puts a third element in there that's completely uh, not biased, it's totally neutral, like these are, these are the facts, this is what's happening, um, so let's have a discussion about that. Um, and it's down to you, do you want to change it, are you happy with it as it is? Um, so it sort of gives, it stops being about personalities as well I guess, and then it becomes about the neutral, the data. Um, and whether whether someone's happy with that or not, um, <clears throat> but it also, I imagine, it gives the CF team something to go off. Um, and so let's let's look at your your week. Um, actually, you you quite regularly miss Wednesday evenings. So what happens on a Wednesday evening? Um, is is that something? So if if you're going to work, could you do it beforehand? Um, it really allows you to to look in really fine detail at your week. And so actually. <clears throat> missing those Wednesday evenings over the course of a month or three months actually means that you're you're missing this much percentage wise of your treatment so although it, it it's a smallish part of your week but actually that builds up to a bigger picture and again the, having the data there helps helps you see the bigger picture in a way that you perhaps wouldn't have done before. I find that using the health hub helps form a habit um, and once you have the habit of taking your nebulizer, it reduces some of the burden and makes it easier to take. So CF Health Hub has helped me form a routine with my nebs, especially when I was working in the morning knowing that I had to be out at a certain time. It's now no longer a burden to me to take them, it's force of habit which has now made me a lot healthier than what I was. So that's just a short clip of, of some of our patients and their experience of using CF Health Hub and, and what it's meant to them. So this concludes our very brief overview of CF Health Hub Digital Learning Health System and what it offers to nationally to the CF centres in the United Kingdom. But I'd like to ask the audience to consider these points. How do you currently solve this problem in your centre? CF Health Hub is freely available. Would you like it to support your patients? If you would like any further information about the CF Health Hub programme, uh, we'd be more than happy to discuss this with you. Feel free to email myself or Martin Wildman on the email addresses listed. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to our work. Thank you very much for inviting me to do this talk. My name is Kenneth Wu and I'm a physiotherapist at Toronto Auto Cystic Fibrosis Centre in St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. I'm also a PhD candidate um, in the University of Toronto and also a lecturer in the Department of Physical Therapy in the University of Toronto. Today, I'm going to talk about from lung to limb, skeletal muscle dysfunction in adults with cystic fibrosis. I have no relationship to disclose, and um, I received funding for my PhD study. So I have worked in adults with cystic fibrosis for over 19 years ago. Years and in the beginning of my practice, we our focus is, is mainly on secretion clearance. So we use different techniques to help patients to clear the secretions, and also we recommend them to do aerobic exercise to to stay fit and also the health. And then over the years, there are different studies that are coming out that would that change our assessment as well as our treatment. 
example, the study looking at the tipping position and um, recommended as not no more tipping because of the gastric reflux and also study talking about how to improve patients' um, treatment adherence and also whether they should do it before and after mucolytics. Until also up to recently, there were talks about autotoxicity associated with aminoglycosides so that we as physiotherapists have a role to assess patients with these issues as well. Long time ago, we think about CF as a pediatric pay, um, uh, disease. And uh, you, we can see this median age survival curve in Canada. We can see that the, the, it's increasingly dramatically over the years. In the beginning of my practice, and we are seeing patients like these. And then over the year, we, talk, we see people talking about having families and having babies as well. Up to now, the median age survival in Canada is 52.1 now, and we see older people like that. As we, as people with CF getting older, um, there will be newer issues that are coming up associated with the disease as well. And one of them are uh, the muscles issues that we will be talking about. So why is lean muscle important though? So lean muscle atrophy and weakness in CF has been associated with decreased functional capacity decreased mobility and physical activity level, and increase the risk of falling and decrease bone mineral density and increase fracture risk. And as a result, it's also decreased the health related quality of life. And study also shows that uh, limb muscle atrophy is associated with lower lung function and also increased mortality. So we're not talking about just muscles, we're talking about important clinical outcome in people with CF. So uh, when we talk about limb muscle study, obviously we talk about the arms and hands and legs, and we can look at the muscle size and muscle composition or quality. So it's how much muscle is actually in the muscles. We can also look at the muscle strength, endurance, fatigability, and also functional performance. So what we did was um, I did a systematic review and meta-analysis, and that, this is part of my PhD study. And um, I'm going to go over the results um, from this study, from my study. <clears throat> so first thing we look at is the upper arm muscle size. Elbow at L 1993 look at mid upper arm muscle circumference and comparing other with CF and healthy control people, and they find significant differences between the two groups. Um, so other with CF has smaller upper upper arm muscles than healthy controls. And when looking at the quadricep muscle size, um, this is the forest plot from my meta-analysis. I'm gonna go over quickly about um, what different things means. Um, here we use the standardized mean differences. Um, so these are the numbers. And the reason why we use the standardized ones is that different studies use different uh, ways to do the measurement. For example, Elkin et al. 2000 measure the circumference of the thigh muscles and then they estimate the quadricep muscle size. And um, Dufresne and Gruet did they use the CT scan and MRI respectively. So they use different measures using standardized mean difference will basically convert the differences to an index so that we can actually compare different studies. And you can see the diamond here. Diamond is a, this is a summarizing the results from the three studies here. And when you see that this diamond is on the positive side, so you can see that uh, people with CF has smaller number than healthy control. And uh, when the diamond is crossing the zero, you know that there will be non-significant differences between the two groups. And you can see the same results from the 95% confident intervals as well. When not one number is negative, one number is positive, then you know that it's non-significant. And a number, obviously, you can look at also the p-value. Um, the other number that you want to look at is the I square. I square represents the heterogeneity across the different studies. So that means the 
whether they are consistent with each other. When it's zero, that is they are very consistent with each, each other in, uh, in terms of the study result. Uh, when it's too high, then, then you wonder whether you should even combine the study together in the meta-analysis. So from this forest plot, we can see that the adult with CF has smaller quadricep muscles than healthy controls. Then you're thinking when they have smaller muscles, they should have weaker muscles as well. So a study look at the quadricep muscle strength and you can quite the contrary, you can see that the diamond is actually crossing the zero line. So confident interval, 95% confident interval is one is zero, one is positive, And the p-value is also, you can see that it is non-significant. However, when you look at the individual numbers, you can see that the standardized mean difference for all studies are on the positive side. So in general, people with CF have weaker muscles than healthy control, you can see that. And then you can look at individual lines. You can also see that except the Schuster studies, more than 50% of the people in other, in, in other cohorts um, have weaker muscles than healthy controls as well. So this tells us that uh, there is a subgroup of adults with CF as weaker health, uh, muscles than healthy control, although it's not significant. Now, when we look at the quadricep muscle endurance and fatigability, one study find no significant differences between CF and healthy control. And three, the study look at fatigability and the meta-analysis show no significant differences as well between the two groups. When we look at the hamstring, hamstring muscle strength, again, the two study looking at that, we find no significant differences between adults with CF and healthy controls. Hand grip strength is more quite interesting. It is used as a surrogate for upper limb when their other, you know, other measures are lower limbs, obviously. And also some study looking using it as a surrogate for general muscle strength. So there are three study look at, at the hand grip strength comparing people with CF and healthy control. And uh, you can see that there are significant differences because this is diamond is not crossing the zero. And so other with CF has lower hand grip strength than healthy control from this um, forest plot. How about functional performance? There are different ways that you can measure the functional performance. And even with the sit to stand test, you can, you can use one minute sit to stand, you can use 30 second sit to stand, you can, and so you can measure how many times that they do the sit to stand within those period of time. And you can use do, uh, do only one sit to stand or five of them and you measure the time. And there are different jumping tests that you can use as well. Some are uh, more vertical forward jump or the other one uh, can be going upward as well. And you can also use their climb power test. So they climb 10 steps and you measure the time. I'm gonna measure, I'm gonna um, focus on three studies because they're more relevant to what we talk about. Um, the first one is by Martinez Garcia. Uh, at L, and they used the one sit to stand and they measured the time, actually the velocity and power as well. And they find significant differences between CF and healthy control among all, all the variables like time, velocity and power. And for example, for the time people with CF take longer than healthy control. Now, two other studies looking at other um, functional performance testing. Um, the first one look at one minute sit to stand, they find moderate correlations between that and quadricep muscle strength. And our group look at the stair climb power test and we find high correlations between stair climb power test and quadricep muscle strength. So how about associations between muscles and other clinical variables? These studies, ha uh, studies have been looked at these variables. I'm gonna quickly talk about them as well. The first one is lung functions. Um, there are study looking at the quadricep muscle strength and hand grip strength with FVV1 and FVC. You can see from this table that the only one that has significance are the hand grip strength and FVV1. And you can see 
the R, the correlations is 0 0.24, and but it's significant. So the correlations was low, but significant between hand grip strength and lung function. How about quadricep muscle size and nutritional status? When we talk about nutritional status uh, in CF, we always talk about the BMI. However, study talk about the BMI is a good surrogate for adiposity in overweight or obese people. However, for people who are normal size or lean, it, it doesn't really tell anything about their body compositions. So study instead using BIA and to measure the fat-free mass. And then um, when two study looking at the relationship um, um, between that and they find high correlations between quadricep muscle size and nutritional status. How about quadricep muscle and physical activities? There were two studies looking at that. You freshly at our 2009 look at the quadricep muscle size and muscle strength and general physical activities. That means they don't, they did not divide into different levels of intensity. They find significant moderate correlations between quadricep muscle size and physical activity level. However, they did not find any correlations uh, um, or significant correlations between the muscle strength and physical activities. Choose the et al. instead separate um, the physical activity into different intensity level and they find no significant correlations between the mild intensity physical activities and quadricep muscle strength, but they find significant correlations, although moderate, between moderate intensity and vigorous in intensity levels. So that tells you that when you see people with CF, they are walking around, that does, that does not tell you much about the muscle strength. How about when they have pulmonary exacerbation? We both look at the, these issues. They measure the muscle strength on emission when they're discharged and one month post discharge. Um, for the quadricep muscle strength, they find this decrease about 17% at emission, and also the hand grip strength decreased by about 7% at emissions. Then you're thinking, how do they know the baseline uh, muscle strength? So what they did was they recruited a stable group, so people who have CF, but they have no pulmonary exacerbations. And you can see that when they compare their numbers with people who are one month post exacerbation, they find no significant differences in most of these numbers except the FEC percentage predicted. So they can they so they use the one month post exacerbation as a baseline measure for people's muscle strength. So this graph look at the quadricep muscle strength uh, among the different time on emission, discharge, and one month. You can see that there were significant differences among the three measures. Um, then you thought that, oh, maybe because they don't walk around as much when they're in the hospital, that may be the reason why it's, it's significantly reduced. Uh, or, or, um, well, not quite. The study actually find no significant correlations between quadricep muscle strength and length of stay, practice on use, physical activity levels, or step counts. They also find significant differences between the hand grip strength um, between emission and one month post-discharge. Burton find contradicting results though. Um, they find no change in quadricep muscle strength with hospitalization, although they did some individual patient did have some decrease in quadricep muscle strength. They also find moderate correlations between, between quadricep muscle strength and time spent on physical activity level that is at moderate or higher intensity. How about corticosteroid use? Um, we all know that corticosteroid use would decrease the muscle strength. So Barry Gallagher looked at the average daily dose of corticosteroid use of patients, and they did find um, a decrease in muscle strength in the proximal muscles, but not in the distal muscles, which is consistent with what we know already. Um, how about other clinical variables? Um, you can see that there were one study um, finds significant 
correlations, negative correlations between upper arm circumference and inflammation. However, when they look at the muscle strength and they did not find any correlations, significant correlations between testosterone and infection and inflammation. So just to summarize all these results, you can see that there is cortisol muscle atrophy in people with cystic fibrosis and that is associated with poorer nutritional status. And there's also a subgroup of people with CF have having quadriceps muscle weakness, and that is associated with lower physical activity levels and moderate to vigorous intensity. And there's lower hand grip strength in people with CF. That may, be, that may mean that there's lower general muscle strength in people with CF, and that is associated with the lung function. Both the quadriceps and hand grip strength are associated with pulmonary exacerbations. You can know that uh, you can see that I did not talk much about uh, muscle composition or not much about the upper arm either, because actually not, not much study on these at all, and there's no study on muscle composition at this stage. So, so how about the clinical impact? implications. What I would recommend is that because of the weakness, some weakness in quadriceps muscle strength in people with CF and also weakness in the hand grip strength, we should incorporate assessment, uh, these muscle assessment in our general assessment, especially during pulmonary exacerbation. So how do we do that? Um, the first, we can actually use computerized dynamometer to measure the quadricep muscle strength. That is the gold standard for the measurement. However, uh, it is a very expensive equipment and it requires a lot of space as well and some training on to how to use the equipment. We can use fixed portable dynamometer or handheld dynamometer. Um, the handheld dynamometer is not as reliable as the other one, but it's still we can use that. And if you don't, we don't have any of these equipment, we can consider using a stair climb power test or one minute sit to stand test. And we can see that, uh, remember, we, uh, there are correlations between that with the quadricep muscle strength as well. For the hand grip muscle strength, most study use the grip dynamometer to do the measurement as well. However, if you don't have the equipment, you can also consider using a blood pressure cuff. And so basically what you do is you roll the cuff and you pump the pressure up to 20 millimeters mercury, and then you get the patients to squeeze as hard as possible. And then you can calculate the difference and do the measurement that way. So thank you very much for listening. And I would like to thank you, thanks um, Dr. Martha, Martha, my PhD supervisor, and Pollyanna Jana to help me with the systematic review and meta-analysis, and Dr. Stevenson and people from a lab to give me feedback on my presentation as well. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. My name is Jane Bell and I'm a physiotherapist in the Royal Belfast Hospital for Sick Children. Um, we are the Regional Cystic Fibrosis Pediatric Centre in Northern Ireland. And my topic today is nebulizer hygiene in cystic fibrosis evidence-based recommendations. I am part of the Northern Ireland Working Group on nebulizer care and hygiene in cystic fibrosis, and we're supported by an unrestricted medical educational grant from Vertex. So just very quickly, in case you as a PT are wondering why you're listening to a nebulizer session, um, we are slightly different in the UK compared to North America in that physiotherapists work across respiratory, neuro and MSK. So in the case of cystic fibrosis, the physiotherapists that specialise there um, are involved in airway clearance, nebulizer therapy, as well as exercise and postural care. Um, so it's just a wee bit different. Um, and obviously the spelling as well. Um, we use an S, so I hope I've changed the spelling appropriately throughout the presentation. Um, so just to give you a background into this review, um, nebulizer therapy has progressed significantly in recent years, both in terms of the devices used for nebulizers and also the drug formulation. Um, and different devices can be chosen based on um, the studies that have been done in, in the area and also um, the drug dosage and also patient preference. So it means that a patient may start in one nebulizer but may move to another and throughout the course of their journey with cystic fibrosis, they may have a few different nebulizers. So we felt there was a need to develop um, universal guidelines 
um, for nebulizer care that, that would um, move with you as you journey through um, your uh, cystic fibrosis and the use of nebulizers. Now, as you know, there are already some guidelines available. And obviously the DFF Infection Prevention and Control Guideline, which was updated back in 2013, is a really comprehensive document and covers nebulizer care and hygiene. But there is variation in other countries, including the UK. So we wanted to look at the most recent evidence on nebulizer care and then use that to guide and drive local policy. So we formed a multidisciplinary working group with um, CF physiotherapists, CF nurse specialists, and microbiologists, infection control doctors, and clinical psychologists with the aim of looking at the literature and producing some recommendations. And this was published in the peer review journal Breathe in June this year, where you can have a read it at your leisure later. So very quickly, why do we need to um, clean nebulizers? Well, looking at these photographs from the naked eye, you can see why it's important. And I'm ashamed to say these nebulizers belong to a patient in our clinic. Um, but also it, it has a really important effect on the performance of the nebulizer. Um, and things like, it's well known that the mesh of, um, the vibrating mesh of um, nebulizers such as the eFlow um, really need looked after. Um, and if they're not cleaned appropriately, then it can affect their performance over time. Uh, the other really important um, reason for cleaning them is because there have been numerous um, reports in the literature of um, pathogenic microbes being detected in nebulizers. This is a really busy slide, but it's just to take away with the number of gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria and yeast and fungi that have been reported in the literature. And really to draw your attention to the fact that there are really concerning um, significant organisms that have been found and reported in the literature um, in the nebulizers of patients. So it is really important that we consider and nebulizer cleaning and hygiene. So we know there's strong evidence as in the last slide to show there's microbial contamination. And many patients will start nebulizer therapy as part of their eradication therapy. So in the, in the terms of uh, pseudomonas, they may start nebulized colistin or tobramycin. And we want to make sure that eradication therapy is successful and make sure that they are not um, reinfecting themselves from a contaminated nebulizer. And it's really important that we break the chain of transmission. And in the literature, there's many um, reported um, experiences of the patients. And we know that um, the patients are all doing different things at home. And um, they have their own challenges, their own routines, their own practices. And that's been widely documented and, and actually presented here at the North American Conference. During the inpatient stay as well, the manufacturers, very few of them give um, recommendations for inpatient stay, but the CFF infection prevention and control document is one of the few that has gone into looking at what should be done in the inpatient stay um, in terms of the use of single use disposable nebulizers, which can be discarded after 24 hours. Um, and also um, advice that if patients are bringing in their own nebulizers from home. But a recent study in the UK showed that there is much more variation in practice across inpatient facilities. And it also highlighted that there are many challenges for inpatient facilities. In the UK, it is not common practice to use disposable nebulizers, and that could be in part due to the cost implications on the NHS for such a practice. There's also variation in the facilities available, and some centres were reporting that patients were required to take their nebulizer parts home to be disinfected, which obviously has implications if you live a good distance away from where your inpatient facility is. And other things such as uh, a small hospital room, meaning that uh, washing and drying nebulizers away from splash zones and patient sinks can be very difficult. So because of this variation, we need to uh, make sure that there are good evidence-based um, guidelines that can be used to drive local practice. So we looked at the evidence and um, we came up with of, uh, 22 recommendations out of the evidence and this is a summary table which is taken out of the paper and we're just going to um, look at those recommendations today under three headings of clean, disinfect 
and dry. So firstly, when should a nebulizer be cleaned? Well, first and foremost, we should be doing good hand washing before we clean our nebulizer, and that's the patients and the staff. And obviously in hospital, healthcare workers should be washing their hands and using uh, gloves whenever handling patient nebulizers. Deborah and team um, demonstrated that there was a difference in the concentration of the aerosol cloud, as well as the time taken to nebulize when they compared a new Parry LC Plus um, that was unwashed and one that was washed before use. So that demonstrates that a nebulizer really should be cleaned before its very first use. The manufacturers of all the nebulizers advocate washing after each use, and this is confirmed by the CFF Infection Prevention and Control document. And O'Malley further clarifies that it should be done directly after each use. And if that, this is not possible, then any residual medication should be at least rinsed off to prevent it drying on and, and clogging the nebulizer. And then washing should be done at the first opportunity. So clean every time, but where do we clean? So we know hospital sinks can be contaminated from the expectoration of sputum, from the washing of contaminated hands and um, equipment, from the disposal of dirty water down the sink. So hospital sinks may not be best um, place for the cleaning of nebulizers. Um, actually, it has been reported that Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Barcaldera sinuspatia and NTM have been recovered in hospital water systems and in some cases has been linked to infection. So really we want to keep our equipment out of the the hospital sink. At home then, uh, we know that, hospital, that household sinks and drains are known reservoirs of Pseudomonas. And in one study, the environmental strains of Pseudomonas um, that were taken from these areas were identical to those collected from the, the patient's sputum. So sinks are not the appropriate place. Dishwashers have been talked about and a lot of patients would throw their nebulizers into the dishwasher. However, dishwashers are um, a known harbouring of a black yeast. And it has been found that this black yeast lives in dishwashers and also within kitchens that have dishwashers. And interestingly, um, this yeast is usually negligible in kitchens that don't have dishwashers. So it's really not appropriate to put your nebulizer part into a dishwasher. So we know uh, where to clean it and how and when we need to clean it, but how do we clean it? So do we just use tap water? Well, we know that uh, microbes are already present in the sink, but this study showed that up to 8% of tap water has tested positive for Pseudomonas. And there's further evidence to show that Pseudomonas and uh, Burkholderia sinusopatia can be present for weeks or even years after the resolution of an outbreak in a sink. And the feeling is that this is due to biofilm formation. So the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Infection Prevention and Control Guidelines say that water, different water can be used for cleaning nebulizers as long as it is followed by disinfection. So water such as tap water, well water that meets public health standards or bottled water can be used in the cleaning but it must be followed by disinfection. And then looking at the types of detergents used to clean nebulizers. Some manufacturers have advised not to use certain types of um, detergents such as the pearly or opaque ones but there's little evidence in the literature to support or dispute this advice. What is known is the soap itself and the um, dispensing unit can become contaminated with, amongst other things, Burkholderia sinuspatia and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So we must think of soap as a place for harbouring these pathogens as well. So coming out of the literature then, we've come up with these recommendations. On the left, recommendations for at home and on the right, recommendations for hospital. And they are very similar. And the only difference really being is that um, at home, we're recommending that they're washed in the patient's kitchen and in hospital in the patient's um, room or bedroom. 
So it's basically wash your hands, disconnect the nebulizer and disassemble it. Wash all the parts in warm tap water with dishwashing liquid and um, rinse if a final rinse um, is required. When immediate disinfection is not possible, use sterile water as a rinse. So let's move on to disinfection. So we've cleaned our nebulizer, now we need to think about disinfection. So there have been many methods of chemical disinfection described over the years. But it's essential when you consider chemical disinfectants that they are a effective for the decontamination process and b that they're not detrimental to the nebulizer functioning. Um, and in the review, we have covered um, all the different um, chemical disinfectants that have been recommended in the literature and um, looked at how some of them may cause um, corrosion to the nebulizer. Some have suboptimal methods. We all remember vinegar being um, recommended years ago and we now no longer use that. And some of them also have um, safe handling and half-life um, issues, um, which makes it all very confusing for the patient. And uh, as well, the main thing about the chemical um, disinfectant is that none of them are universal for each nebulizer. So you would have to make sure you're using the correct one for the correct nebulizer. Heat as a form of disinfection is a physical method and passes through all the components of the nebulizer, and that makes it a really efficient method of disinfection. Um, it is common with all manufacturers' instructions, so they all recommend heat in some form um, for disinfecting. And the main types of or the types of heat disinfection are boiling, steam, dishwasher, and autoclave. Um, so if we just look first of all at the um, autoclaving at the bottom there, um, some manufacturers do allow their um, nebulizers to be autoclaved um, up to a maximum of 277 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but this isn't a practical solution for at home and also many inpatient facilities don't have um, the facilities for autoclaving at ward level. Uh, steam is a really effective um, method of disinfecting by heat um, and steam using a baby bottle steam steriliser has been described as being very effective. Despite its name, um, it is a method of disinfection and not a method of sterilisation and should be considered as a method of disinfection. The major advantage of steam is that it is an end stage method, meaning that um, if a nebulizer could potentially become contaminated by the tap water it's cleaned in, by the soap it's cleaned in, and by handling, the fact that you're putting it into a baby bottle disinfector and then no more handling means that it, it, it is a good safe method of disinfecting. It has been shown to be effective against a wide range of pathogens, including those listed there. And in the Hoff and Vorder study, um, Pseudomonas and NTM were not detected in either wet or dry nebulizers following steam disinfection. Uh, different brands of steam disinfector were looked at and found to be equally effective. Uh, the, the Wabi Steam Sterilizer Plus model is the only um, disinfector manufacturer who have endorsed their product for nebulizer disinfection. Um, Unfortunately, it's only available in the United States, so it's not available worldwide, but hopefully other um, steam sterilizer or disinfector companies, manufacturers, will start to look at this for their nebulizers as well. Steam is a really simple, fast way of disinfecting and there are no consumables required other than tap water. And it can be used with all nebulizers, including those with metal parts such as the vibrating mesh, as long as it's an um, electric steam disinfector as opposed to a microwave one. And uh, the Hoff and Vorder study looked at storing the nebulizer inside, um, which is a, a real advantage as well. I'll talk about that later. So our recommendations for disinfection um, are the same for home and in hospital, but in washed and rinsed nebulizers, it should be disinfected after each use using an electric baby bottle steam disinfector. 
autoclaving is another option within hospital whenever the manufacturer states that that is appropriate. So then drying of our nebulizers. Desiccation is recognized in microbiology terms as a technique to effectively kill bacteria. It has shown to be effective in most cases after cleaning and air drying of the, of the nebulizer in, in a study by Manor et al. And it is a method that has been shown to cause the least recontamination when compared with active methods of drying, such as um, uh, so air drying, sorry, has been shown to be the method of le causing least recontamination compared with active drying using cloths. It is the technique of choice recommended by many manufacturers. And um, a study shown published this earlier this year showed that all pseudomonas organisms were um, killed when, when dried for 24 hours. This the study by Muradal also showed there was marked differences in time to fill drying between assembled and disassembled nebulizers. The authors concluded that air drying can reduce pseudomonas counts to undetectable levels if done properly. However, if not dried fully, then it can be detected in high level. So it's really important that um, if drying is to be done, that the, the, the nebulizer is disassembled fully um, and dried thoroughly. In another study, it was found that Mycobacterium abscessus and Staphylococcus aureus could survive on plastic surfaces for more than 24 hours during air drying. So therefore, we can't consider air drying as a critical control for eliminating these organisms without having done some steam disinfectant. The study I mentioned previously about Hoffen, by Hoffenwarter um, they actually challenged whether air drying is necessary at all and they left the nebulizers that had been disinfected in the baby bottle disinfector undisturbed for 24 hours and found that it was the nebulizers remained bacteria free as long as they were undisturbed. This also takes away the necessity of storing the um, nebulizers. Um, a study by Alexander et al um, showed that 80% of patients um, had at least one of their storage boxes positive for bacteria and or fungi, um, although these had a low contamination rate. So our drying recommendations, again, home on the left, hospital on the right. So leave the disinfected nebulizer parts undisturbed in the disinfector until next use. Should they need to be disturbed, then the disinfection process should be repeated before the, the, the next use of the nebulizers. And you'll see that those recommendations are the same for both home and hospital, so therefore there's less confusion. So in summary, this is the summary of our um, the evidence and of the recommendations. And these recommendations, when set out in a flow, simple flow diagram like this, show that they are really simple to follow, yet they're evidence-based and they're robust. And the important thing is that they waver very differently between home and hospital. So there is going to be less confusion, both for patients and for hospital workers. Making instructions clear, simple and robust are vitally important to prevent confusion and to drive adherence. People who live with cystic fibrosis have very busy routines. And the slide on the right is one I've shown before where Mark Wahlberg um, tweeted his daily routine. And you can see there that his daily routine consisted of golf and family time and lunch and meetings and picking up the kids from school. And a patient with cystic fibrosis retweeted it with her own routine and showed that her own routine, that cystic fibrosis takes up a lot of her day. Now you'll notice that nebulizer cleaning is not um, listed there, but obviously it's a real part of the day. So we need nebulizer care to be an integral part of the daily routine, but we need it to be clear and simple and straightforward to do. So thank you for listening.
Um, our Nebulizer group, we have set up a website listed here where you can find the review to read yourselves. And we also have um, developed some animations both for adults and children um, and some um, colouring in and things for children just to help the education. So I'm going to leave you now with Sarah to have the final word. Um, and if anyone has any questions and they'd like to chat on the chat feature, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you very much for listening. This talk will discuss remote rehab monitoring in lung transplant during the COVID pandemic, the lessons that we've been learning and future opportunities for CF. I have no uh, disclosures to declare. The objectives of this uh, presentation are to review the role of exercise and physical activity in CF management, to describe the adoption of telerehabilitation in lung transplant candidates and recipients at a large lung transplant center in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and finally to discuss strategies to customize virtual rehab to the CF population. So we know physical activity and exercise in CF is associated with aerobic exercise capacity. It's an independent predictor of mortality. It's a well-established cornerstone of CF care and that higher levels of exercise capacity pre lung transplant are associated with lower morbidity and mortality pre and post lung transplant. So we know with COVID that there was official recommendations for physical and social distancing and isolation. And this is a recent article uh, that came out looking at how this recommended shielding against COVID impacted physical activity levels in adults with cystic fibrosis. And this was a web-based survey um, and it asked if uh, during the lockdown between mid-March and mid-May people had uh, their levels of physical activity were less, more, or unchanged. So they had 327 participants and 25% of these had had a lung transplant and 45% reported less physical activity, although they reported similar airway clearance and inhalation therapy adherence. Again, this survey asked um, just to get perceptions of physical activity change. So it asked just, did you have less, more, or unchanged physical activity levels? It didn't specifically measure physical activity estimates such as daily steps or minutes spent in moderate intensity activity. And the reasons that were given for reduced physical activity includes, include closed training facilities, lack of motivation, lack of a daily structure, and cancelled supervised training. So at our lung transplant center, our traditional model is mandatory rehabilitation that is on site and supervised three times a week until the time for transplant. So initially done at our center and then uh, for a maintenance program, a combination of at our center and at local rehab centers. And this again is to optimize fitness for surgery and mitigate physical frailty, and then to help post-transplant uh, recovery of function. And uh, at our program, uh, CF is one of the top three indications for transplant, representing about 15% of transplant uh, patients. And in 2019, we had 24 transplants for people with CF. And this mandatory on-site rehab, we have heard from patients over the years that it really adds to their treatment burden in terms of the time required to attend rehab and to participate. And our rehab program for our CF patients has not been very flexible because we can only have two people in the room and they have to be separated. And we have our sepatia positive patients at the end of the day, so people can't drop in. It's less flexible. So that's added to the... Um, the complexity of their home uh, treatment requirements. So we had been thinking for um, a number of years of how to eventually offer some sort of telerehabilitation. And we know that there's different models of telerehab or telepulmonary rehab. Um, there's synchronous models where patients are 
exercising in live time and they're being supervised by video conferencing, um, telemonitor telemonitoring of biometrics, um, and this could be supervised individually or at group sessions. And then there's the asynchronous model where people are exercised, they download their information, and then the healthcare professional will review it at another time, so not in live time. And this can be done by phone or web base or an app base. There's not a lot of information on telerehab, although I think that's going to change in the upcoming years. But there was one study which was a web-based program using motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral strategies to increase physical activity in CF. And it was found to be feasible and acceptable, but 80% of the participants would have preferred a mobile app interface. So again, uh, telepulmonary rehabilitation, um, pre-COVID, uh, it, uh, people would do their exercise um, at home, but initially they would have an intake assessment in, in person. So they would have a functional assessment, they might have their initial training uh, done on site, and then transition to home or remote monitoring. And really the rationales for uh, tele-rehab was to improve access, so people that lived in remote areas, or there was no center-based programs that were available, and to increase adherence and sustainability by decreasing the treatment burden of travel, for example. And again, pre-COVID, if you can remember, um, the environment was very different. There was easy access to local community centers and gyms. It was safe to walk outside for our patients with respiratory disease. And it was fairly easy to purchase home exercise and monitoring equipment in a timely manner. And we know that during COVID, especially in the spring, the environment and landscape was very different. And because we're a, a lung transplant center, uh, we continually had people being listed uh, for transplant uh, in the spring and we had and assessing these people. And because we were quite restricted for having anyone come on site, we were having to do some remote functional assessment, something that we hadn't done and really isn't in the literature very much. And I will be talking to that a little bit later in the presentation. The rationale, so again, as I mentioned before, we always had special infection control procedures for the CF patients. Their schedule is fairly inflexible. We can only have a couple, pe couple people with CF in the room at a time. But now that infection control concerns are for everybody. So um, really the rationale for uh, remote rehab is, you know, preventing these large groups of people coming together and that they can exercise closer to home and in the safety of their own house. And again, the environment. So we know the program programs that have been closed. This is advice to physically distance. And it was hard, especially in the spring, um, for our patients to get um, equipment. So both auximeters and um, exercise equipment that they could exercise effectively at home. So before COVID, because we had recognized this need to try to support people closer to home, we were starting a pilot project of a surgical transition solution. And so we were piloting a customizable web-based remote care app. And this is from a third party vendor. And this allowed our team, so both our rehab team and our medical team to develop personalized care plans, um, determine what biometric data we wanted to be monitored uh, on the app, set up clinical alerts. So if people had a low oxygen saturation or a low step count, for example, uh, that would be tracked, uh, highlighted on the app. It has educational resources in a library, both text and video based, that um, there were some that were already there and then we could make our own and uh, put them into the app that's very relevant and particular to our program. There's prompts and reminders in terms of what and when to read or watch on the app. And then there's surveys, so symptom surveys, physical activity surveys, et cetera. And then the main method of communication is, as is this asynchronous texting. And again, um, any communication with a patient, all the multidisciplinary members can see it uh, in terms of what's being communicated. Um, it has video conferencing capability and there's ability to do teach back in, in terms of um, patient education. And I just wanna say here is this is a platform that we're, we're piloting, but really virtual care isn't about the technology. It's about what uh, do your patients and the 
providers need and how can technology support that versus us having to work around the technology and the limitations. And there's some limitations with this platform currently, um, but really thinking that it's the service and the delivery of care that's important and not specifically the technology. So I want to present some early program evaluation results. So as I said, we started this pilot project and we started it in January of this year. And we were slowly ramping up to uh, test uh, with 10 to 20 patients. And then mid-March, we had to rapidly adopt it and, and give it to everybody. Um, so again, we hadn't fully tested it out. We were still developing some aspects of it, but we were fortunate to actually have some infrastructure that had gone through uh, our institutional uh, institutional departments of security and legal and digital and privacy. So at least we had something to work with. We had a bit of a heads up. And so what I want to present is some data on people who use the app for at least four weeks between mid-March and September 1st. Of, September 1st. And um, I haven't had a chance to tease out just the CF patients. So I'm going to present on all of our lung transplant candidates and recipients. So there's 118 of all diagnoses. So 80 lung transplant candidates and 38 uh, lung transplant recipients within the first three months uh, post-transplant. So one of the surveys I put in the app was a baseline rehab survey. So what kind of resources they have at home. And you can see that the majority of people did have an eximeter, but I will say that there's really a variety of quality of, of eximeters, and not a lot of people had medical grade oximetry. And uh, for our patients that have very high oxygen needs and have very rapid and profound desaturation with minimal activity, uh, that is a concern um, if you don't have a high quality oximeter, as we would usually depend on uh, in a center based program. Uh, only 41% had a treadmill. And again, this is a time when we weren't advocating for people to walk outside, so that is uh, some limitation there. Uh, about three quarters had some weights, 30% um, uh, had an activity tracker, and 28% reported being alone during the day when they were exercising. It's had some implications for prescription and safety. So another survey I have on the app is the a RAPA or the Rapid Assessment of Physical Activity. And so here I'm just presenting the lung transplant candidate data, so pre-transplant. When they start on the app and they start the remote rehab program, they're asked to fill out the survey and then after four weeks they fill it out again. So what you can see here is at baseline um, and then after four weeks uh, more people who were non-active became active and uh, that's a good thing, that's what we want to see. And I have some data from post-transplant. So at three months post-transplant, uh, we were asking uh, lung transplant recipients to do the, the RAPA as well. And you can see that the majority, so 82% reported being physically active. And so this means that they were um, uh, participating in at least 30 minutes of moderate intensity activity at least five days a week. So meeting that 150 minutes of physical activity uh, that are in the physical activity guidelines. Again, here's another uh, screen with uh, post-transplant recipients. So I was just looking in the app at the changes in their training loads from around six weeks post-transplant uh, to about three months post-transplant. So on the left side, you can see in the people that had a treadmill, um, they were able to increase uh, their speed on the treadmill and they were increasing the time or the minutes on the treadmill. Um, and on the right hand side in terms of quadricep weight, see that they increase the amount of weight that they used with the exercise. And again, this is dependent on the type of equipment they have at home. So if they don't have a lot of options to increase their weight, they only have a couple weight uh, levels, then we might have to say, you know, increase in, uh, in sets um, or maybe reps or in decreasing the time between the reps and other strategies if we can't actually increase uh, the weights. So again, in the app, it's very easy to do uh, satisfaction surveys. So pre-transplant, um, greater than 80% agreed or strongly agreed that the remote monitoring app and the care delivered through the app help prepare them for surgery, help them learn about their condition, and empower them to manage their health condition. 
And post-transplant, uh, again, over 80% agreed or strongly agreed that um, it supported their journey through recovery. The daily check-ins were helpful. So again, the daily check-ins are um, daily reminders to do their exercise program. Um, they get prompts to uh, put in their spirometry levels, their temperature, their heart rate, blood pressure, et cetera, and then prompts to do certain things. And then they found the texting and video visits were very helpful and it increased their confidence in taking care of themselves after surgery and empowered them to manage their health condition. So we also asked the physiotherapist, so there's three physiotherapists that work in the lung transplant program, uh, how they were using the app and their perspective on the app. Um, so between the end of March and the end of August, uh, they did almost 400 video visits uh, with patients as clinical activity at our institution was um, fairly restricted. And we asked about um, benefits and barriers. So clinical benefit, uh, they felt that patients had access to education resources. It was easy to give them those resources. Um, they liked getting the patient reported biometrics, so oxygen saturation, heart rate, body scales, et cetera very easy to communicate with them asynchronously uh, via text, and that they could quickly monitor trends, weekly trends in exercise and biometrics on the app. Um, they found less benefit with a clinical assessment remotely and identifying an early clinical change. And in terms of barriers, uh, strong barriers were the um, availability of a reliable remote functional assessment, and I'll talk to that in a bit. Um, again, some people didn't have access to home exercise or monitoring equipment, so that made it very challenging. And again, there wasn't this time to plan. We had to suddenly pivot and adopt this remote monitoring uh, delivery of care. Uh, the exercise prescription and progression, again, that kind of ties into a lack of monitoring and equipment. Uh, that can be challenging and definitely uh, real increases in clinical workflow uh, that um, were new. And again, a more of a challenge. So when we had to go to this uh, remote monitoring, there were a number of people that had already been exercising on site. So they were used to the program. We knew them. We, we knew where they were. And probably the, the transition was a little bit easier, especially if they had equipment. Um, but in, this, in, in uh, the spring, we had new people that were continuing to be listed for transplant, and they had never been on site. And that was definitely a challenge or more of a challenge in terms of trying to provide a good remote rehab program for these people. And there's a lack of integration with Bluetooth devices. So some people have Bluetooth devices, but this app in the current form as we're using it is only manual entry. Um, didn't have a lot of barriers with patient adherence. Most uh, uh, patients did well with that. Again, privacy, because it had gone through a lot of our, the privacy security features at our facility and then exercise monitoring was not a big barrier. So this is a rapid review that was published a few weeks ago, and this is looking at home-based or remote exercise testing in chronic respiratory disease during COVID and beyond. And um, why they wanted to look at this, obviously there was this huge rapid shift um, by necessity to remote monitoring. Um, certainly in the literature, home rehab or you know telerehab has, has occurred in the past and it's shown fairly similar outcomes to center-based rehab but traditionally the assessment is always done on site so exercise assessment to to determine functional status to see if they desaturate how do you prescribe exercise that's usually on site so this um, study wanted to look at what has been done in either the home, so the home being, it's done in the patient's home, but there still is a person, a healthcare professional there supervising, or remote exercise testing where it's completely remote, so it's in their home, likely, and uh, there's no one there. And so this included 84 studies, and the tests included six-minute walk tests, so both indoor in someone's house or outdoor if there wasn't a lot of space in their home. It had six versions of the sit to stand test, five versions of step tests, and the timed up and go. And there really was limited information for remote assessment. So most of these studies were looking at home-based assessments. And the sit to stand and the step tests um, had 
less oxygen to saturation than the six minute walk test. Although longer sit to stand tests, like the uh, one minute sit to stand test would have more desaturation than a five time sit to stand test. Again, the sit to stand tests do have a moderate to strong correlations with exercise capacity and the longer the test, because there's many variants of this test, um, the, the better. Now, part of our lung transplant assessment, functional assessment, we always do the six minute walk test, but we also do the short physical performance battery. And this was not, rep this was not represented in any of the studies in this rapid review. And what we did in the spring, realizing that we wanted some sort of assessment with, the, with our patients, either initial or serial tests to see if they were uh, deteriorating in their function, is we filmed our short physical performance test and we sent it to people ahead of time. And they would watch it and they would set up, uh, in preparation for our video visit, they would set up all the equipment that they needed, particularly a standard height for a chair, how to measure that, how to measure the track for the gate speed. And then uh, we would do the test by video and uh, we would make sure that there was someone uh, in the house supervising uh, them during the test. So we've been, we've been doing that in quite a few um, uh, people quite successfully. So lastly, in terms of uh, future opportunities, so when we look at remote um, monitoring and virtual care programs, and one um, area that um, I'm working on right now is really thinking how to co-design with our patients. So um, specifically for the CF patients, what do they need in terms of exercise um, training? What's very specific to them? How could we structure the app or tailor the app to their needs? Uh, one of the feedback, again, we were putting a lot of videos um, in March of at-home exercise programs and what was available before we made our own uh, were, were videos from the COPD population. So again, one of the comments was um, everyone in these videos you know, is over 60 years old and I'm 20 and can you do videos with showing someone who's younger? So some engaging patients and, and, and getting feedback of what they want and what's useful for them um, is important. Also looking at how we can integrate Bluetooth enabled devices such as oximeters um, to get serial trends of um, oxygen saturation only during exercise, but also uh, during ADLs, activities of daily living and other activities. Um, again, um, integrating activity trackers, uh, Bluetooth exercise equipment, as well as um, uh, textile, so certain smart clothing and AI. And, and really, I think this is combining with companies to collect this data, manage this data, and then give it to clinicians to really determine how to make clinical, clinical decisions out of this information. So really collaborating with these partners to see uh, what would be useful, what's gonna answer our question, how can we best support um, uh, patients. So just to finish up, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the funding and support that I have gotten um, for my postdoc fellowship and for the uh, institutional funding uh, to pilot this app. And uh, I look forward to um, the future and further developing and customizing uh, this uh, model of care uh, to specific populations, including CF. Thank you very much.